questions and then we'll take a few from the audience as well. Now we know you primarily as Ray from Star Wars and, yeah. <laughs> and so and I'm, I'm assuming that you're offered an extreme range of films and roles to play. When this came around, what made you decide to play Ophelia? Why did you want to do this as opposed to what I'm sure were five other offers you had? Um, I would say that I think I, um, so far, have chosen pretty well. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I mean, I did choose Star Wars, but, you know, they offered it and I was like, sure. Yeah. Um, it just, it sort of all fell into place at the right time. I really like the script, and usually these things take forever to get made. Um, but Naomi, I think, was already attached, and Claire was already attached, and they've been trying to make for such a long time. It was one of those things that I liked it, and timing just worked out that it ended up happening. Um, yeah, and I'm very happy we're here now. And Claire, this is Claire, an Australian director, and Semi Chalice, who wrote the screenplay, a name that I've associated only with Mad Men, which seems like a very different universe. Um, could you talk a little bit about working with this essentially female director, female screenwriter, and if Ophelia that we've just seen is anything, it is the most wonderfully revisionist take on Shakespeare in terms of female autonomy and spunk, and the way you play the character, the wit, the bravery. Um, so was that always a part of the process of making the film? Women sitting around going, we can do this? <laughs> Um, it's so weird, I think it, uh, like I was saying today, that I think a lot of people haven't even had the chance to work with a female director, and I'm so lucky that so early on I was able to. And again, I didn't choose it because of that, it just was fortunate that it all came together in that way. It never felt like that so much, I'm sure there were questions of it, but ultimately, we were just trying to make a great film, and ultimately it was just great how it came about that it was a female writer, and of the book, a female writer and a female director. Um, yeah, and it was and it was uh, great to play someone who you know we were exploring in a different way than she's explored in the play. Yes. Now, had you been quite familiar with with the work of Shakespeare in general and the play Hamlet in particular? In other words, were you coming to this with a sense of having read, watched, or lived any Ophelia before? Um, I had seen. Uh, there's a, a group called, oh my god, I'm going to forget what they're called again, <laughs> Tiger Lilies. They're a very strange, I'm not sure if anyone's heard of them, they're a very strange sort of immersive theatre group. And we went to go see a version of Hamlet years ago, and my gran was like, what was that? Because <laughs> she, you know, was not used to things like that. Anyway, it came around to doing Ophelia, and I did the thing, and I thought, cool, I didn't want to watch anything, just in case it threw me off and Tom Hiddleston I think at the time was playing Hamlet and I was like I can't watch it because it will be fantastic and I'll feel like I can never do justice and then I finished and my best friend was like as if we studied it at A level and I was like did we? And I had totally forgotten that we did it at, at A level but I think I was I'm, I'm happy with how it came about because I think otherwise I just would have felt this like you know and then I did say that I hadn't seen Ken Branagh's version of it, and then my agent who looked after Kate Winslet emailed me and was like, "Ha, ah, Kate played a feeling, and I was like, oh God. Uh, I like that, no. um, but I was, yeah, I was happy that I hadn't seen other versions. It was actually a few years ago in New York, I don't know, it was downtown, so maybe some of you are familiar, Bedlam Hamlet. It was a, a small theater group, and they had basically four actors doing all of the parts, and it was very physical, utilizing the stage, and I, I, I have vivid memories of it. I think that was possibly one of the most intriguing Hamlets I had ever seen. But you did mention in passing someone who is very important to this discussion. This is based on a book by Lisa Klein. It was written in 2006. It's a first novel for young adults. So the vision comes to some extent, and we were just talking backstage about how her next book was Lady Macbeth's Daughter, now, oh. here's an oxymoron for you. Um, <laughs> Lady Macbeth's daughter uh, were supposedly 
uh, Macbeth and his wife did have a child, oh. and she was raised by three sisters and they were strange ladies and has powers. Um, so from its very origin, this, this story came from a very specific literary place. But I'm suspecting that while you were making the film, something else takes over. The, the process of whether it's rehearsal or the way that everyone works together. I was especially curious about Naomi Watts because this is a film that not only gives Ophelia her full voice, it widens the frame for other female characters as well, providing that surprising backstory that Gertrude has a twin sister, a witch or a healer named Mechthild, oh. and that Naomi Watts plays both of them, I think, with ferocious um, intensity. Mm. Could you talk a bit about working with her, especially if she was cast first? Um, it was... Uh... I think it's a, I mean, you can say a, great thing, a great thing that Naomi is in. Like, she's so good in it, I thought, in both roles, and obviously they're incredibly different. It was great. It, it was also, like, a very intense, this scene where she has me up against the wall. It was really, uh, I remember being like, <gasps> it was super intense at times, and then very gentle and very sweet. And it, you did sort of feel like the unraveling of everything as the character of Gertrude was unraveling. Um, and then the Mechdild stuff obviously started out more frosty and then became much more nurturing. Um, it's pretty insane for a person to do two roles in a film. Um, and it was quite different working with her in, in both um, spheres, but also great. And like even doing the scene where I'm reading the book, it felt so intimate and um, yeah, it was awesome. And was there a lot of rehearsal? We had like, I think two days, a little while before we started filming and then we were straight into it. And I've been doing crazy press for the souls and I was so tired and I had just become vegan, so I was really tired. <laughs> and I remember we were like rehearsing, I was on the sofa having a nap. I was like, guys, oh my God, how am I gonna do this thing? And we got straight into it. And it was like a very full on, we did it in two months and it was like, it was, it was a lot of work. I know this is perhaps an unfair comparison, but is it very different for you as an actor approaching a role like this in a relatively low budget, female oriented period film versus Star Wars? And I, I realize we're talking about a franchise, but the directors who did, who did all three parts of the trilogy in which you star, um, is the approach terribly different? Or are there certain things that you appreciate from a director that transcends the genre or the nationality, whether it is the way that they work with you in rehearsal or during the takes? Um, I, I think there are some actors that have a whole thing, a whole process, and which is great. I just don't have that. I just, um, I don't know, I just like do the thing, like somebody said, oh, do you have a playlist? Do you have music? I was like, no. It's not like I, I don't, I think an awful lot about what I'm about to do, but I don't really have like, okay, I'm gonna approach this as well, I'm gonna approach this that way. So in that way, no, there's no big difference for me. I approach, I think, most things the same. I guess the difference is the familiarity that you have when you work with someone for a longer time, because this was so short. It's um, getting, like, the conversation can be hard when you're like, you know, very intimate in a very short space of time. So it feels slightly different, especially coming back with Jojo this time with Star Wars. There's such a comfort. It's like a shorthand when you're being directed. And so that's really the only difference. Otherwise, the scale and everything, things take longer when there's, you're in space. Um, but otherwise, it's, I, I would say it's, it's um, fairly similar. And also, I'm just really, really lucky that the men I've worked with have been phenomenal. Like, Ray is a phenomenal character, and she was created by guys, so it, it's great to work with a female director, but also like all the love to the men I've worked with, because they've also been um, joyful and made me feel loved and supported and, and you know pushed in a great way. We might as well throw in somebody you just mentioned earlier, which is Kenneth Branagh, because mm -hmm. he directed Daisy Ridley in Murder on the Orient Express. Um, and he's another one of these formidable so actor, director, producers, um, able to do both period um, historical films and a very sort of contemporary as well. 
and, and you recently worked with a director I admire a great deal, an American, Doug Lyman. Um, some of you know him from the Bourne films. Uh, Chaos Awakening, is that? Chaos Walking. Chaos Walking. I'm sorry, Chaos Walking. <laughs> oh, no, no, Obviously, no, it has no, not been open, so I don't have it exactly right. And um, I'm just curious, again, if you compare someone like the American Doug Lyman and the Australian Claire McCarthy, um, Kenneth Bragg, is there anything that you consider to be more of a national, you know, identity, or that doesn't even count? I mean, Doug is a thing unto himself. <laughs> he is. I did. So I saw Doug yesterday. They're actually doing a screening of Curse Walking tonight in New Jersey with like no the effects. So if you see anything about it being terrible, please, it will be a good film. <laughs> Give it time. It's way too early. I don't know why they're doing it. Um, he 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 is a person unto himself. And uh, yeah, that's a whole, we literally filmed, we filmed right after Ophelia, we did Chaos Walking for three and a half months, and we just did another three weeks. And now I think they have a film. Uh, that's, a, that's a very different thing. In terms of nationality, I don't know, maybe I did feel a different thing with, with Ken, but really I don't think so. The only thing I guess is being surrounded by more theatre people, I guess, with Ken. Like, that's really the one thing I can think of. And and everyone had just done the Kenneth Branagh season. Uh, so that was really nice, because again, it gives the cast an intimacy that I hadn't really had before, which is very welcoming and wonderful. And even though the thought of stage is terrifying, I do think to, to have relationships like that with people that you're working with must be just amazing. Yes. Before we take um, some audience questions, I'm curious because I know that you studied singing and I read that there was a recording session with Barbara Streisand, Whoop. Anne Hathaway, oh, and Daisy Ridley doing the song at the ballet, mm -hmm. uh, which was for an encore album a few years ago. So I'm wondering, because now you're increasingly on everybody's radar as somebody of great talent and versatility, would you want to do a musical film where you get the chance to sing too? I have dropped so many hints. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I sat next to one of the heads of Disney, Alan Horn, and I was like, oh, God, if only there was a musical for me to do. <laughs> Still nothing. I'm like talking about in interviews, every meeting I have, I'm like, I'd love to do a musical, I'd love to do a musical. Still nothing. I have to just believe that timing is the thing, and when it's the right timing, it'll happen, but... And one, from me well. one never knows who's in the audience for a Q and A sneak preview. <laughs> yeah. Who either has a script or knows the producer of an upcoming musical that has not yet been cast. So you just got to put it out there into the ether, um, which might be a good time to open up. If there are a few, I have more questions. Obviously, oh, there are quite a few from you. Uh, all right, I'm gonna actually. There are two down here, two in the back, and at least two here. Um, we'll start on this side, and I'll get to this side. So, the gentleman on the island and the woman here. And I'll repeat. First, thank you for your work and uh, for your talent. In Ophelia, which of the scenes was the hardest for you to act and why? Which of the scenes in Ophelia was the hardest to act and why? Um, the hardest, uh, ultimately, it wasn't, in terms of emotional stuff, there was physical stuff that was hard, but in terms of emotional stuff, the thing I was most scared of was the flower scene, just because it's so well known in the play. Um, and, and I knew it was going to take a long time. I think they gave us two days to do it, and I thought, I don't know if I have the stamina to do this. So going into it, I was um, uh, most scared, and then weirdly, I really enjoyed it, because it was so, like, the writing in that in particular is so moving. Anyway, it wasn't hard to, to you know, do the thing. So I was most anxious about it, and then, it was tricky, like I was tired, um, but pushing through. And it was also the first time I really felt, oh, like I did it, I was scared and I really carried on and was able to, what I felt like, you know, do my best job I could do, um, take after take. Hi, um, I just want to say that you're back to the And I was just wondering what your favorite scene, this kind of like older film that you've done, has been the favorite or like most fun to film? What is the favorite scene that you've had to film from all of the movies? This is such a stupid question. 
stupid answer. I really appreciate everyone coming out here and I'm sorry for what I'm about to tell you. <laughs> but when we were filming, because it's a thing that springs to mind, when we were filming, there was a scene in Murder on the Orange Express where somebody, I'm presuming it was Johnny and Josh Gad, who is hilarious, had to walk through the carriage and we all had to sit there looking incredibly shifty. And he goes, oh my God, I'm doing my best too far at acting. And I was like, huh? And he goes, yeah. When you're just looking around as if, as if somebody farted. <laughs> and you're like, who did it? And it was so stupid. <laughs> Everyone, Dame Judi Dench, Derek Jacobi, we were all like, oh my God. And no one had really like lost their shit before. Because, you know, Ken's great, but I was also like, if you start laughing, I don't want to be thrown off this set. Like, <laughs> look at everyone who's around me. And it, it, I mean, it sounds so stupid, but it was hilarious. And watching it, I think I've, I've only watched the film once. I would like to rewatch it just to see if you can see that everyone was trying really hard not to laugh. <laughs> okay, we were going to the back there. I see, oh, there are a few hands. Okay, um, straight ahead, there's uh, the person with glasses. Yes? You first, and then you. You didn't hear some women in their 20s feel like they have imposter syndrome. Was there ever a moment that you also would have felt that you didn't belong in that workspace? Um, I have had it with most of my work, yes, but weirdly, as my confidence has grown in work, at the beginning of Force Awakens, I remember thinking, there is no way. Like, this is, oh, I just thought, let's just cut it now. Like, I'll just go home, get someone else in. But weirdly, my confidence in the workspace has grown. Weirdly, my social imposter syndrome has grown. I spend, I spend a lot of time thinking, oh, nobody wants to talk to me. No, like, why am I even here? So weirdly, I have it more with social stuff now, which I think is strange, and hopefully that goes. But it also, I, I know how lucky I am that in my work situation, I've really been made to feel like, like I, I belong there. Yeah. Gentlemen in the back, and then to the right, yes. <laughs> Look at the t shirt. <laughs> I have a feeling this is going to be like your big breakout role and you might get some. Uh, yeah. You might get some big projects after this. Do you have any upcoming projects that you want to give us any information about? Do you have any upcoming projects that you want to give us information about? Because this may be your breakout role. You know. um, uh, I am uh, attached to a film about a woman called Virginia Hall, um, who I started reading the book about her and I had to take a break because she did so many phenomenal things. It's actually hard to take in. She, like, it's really nuts. It's really nuts what she did. And the hardest bit, because I'm making that with Bad Robot, the hardest bit they said is finding how to find the one thing they're gonna talk about or like the main narrative because there was so much that she did, it's actually hard finding the main thing. Cause, because my uh, understanding was that she helped a lot of people through the mountains, like she helped them. She was an American spy during World yes. War II working with the British. Working with the British in France. And my understanding was that she, she did this arduous trek through these mountains time and time and time again with a lot of people and she only had one leg. She accidentally shot her leg off. As you did. <laughs> and a lot of people were not able to make the journey once. She made it time and time and time again. And then I started reading the book and I was like, she did so much more. And she was in France for two years. Usually spies were sent for six months and then you had to be taken out. Like everyone was looking for her. And she stayed for two years. She helped so many people. And, uh, and it's pretty amazing reading it now because there are you know a lot of really brave people doing things that are going against what they're being told it's the right thing. Um, and it's uh, it's exciting. So yes, hopefully that will be coming soon. I'll come back to the back. I did say that on the right we had one. So there's a gentleman on the aisle and then the woman right here. Uh, Daisy, I think it's time. A lot of directors are into musicals. Once again, with West Side Story coming back, I think you'd be a perfect Eliza Doolittle for mm. My Fair Lady. <laughs> the suggestion is perfect Eliza Doolittle for My Fair Lady. So if any of you know of anyone looking to make that project, you know. okay. uh, yes. Hi, Daisy. Um, you're a real wonderful discoverer. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if you have any advice for people who are interested in working with you or someone who's interested in working with you. Um, 
that you've received about your work or the characters you've portrayed, um, and why does it make an impression on you? What's the greatest compliment or feedback that you've had to a role that you've portrayed, and why? Um, the thing that sticks out uh, on the theme of Ophelia, um, I, th so there was an original cut of Ophelia that I was really, really not happy with. I saw it and I cried and I was really upset and it took quite a while for it to be recut and everything. So once I saw the new cut and I was like, oh, okay. Um, I arranged, every all of this started happening, which was very exciting. And I arranged a screening for my friends and family. Now my mum is incredibly encouraging, but um, uh, she doesn't really, you know, like uh, th there hasn't been like an, a thing that she said before uh, this really. And I did the screening and I came out at the end and she was there and like uh, some of her best friends who like helped raise me and my sisters were there. My dad was around, but you know, like extra <laughs> sort of family friends. Um, and she was like crying and she was really moved by it. And it does make sense if you see your daughter go through terrible things on screen. It makes sense that you would cry, but it was weirdly the thing that affected me the most because I was like, oh, okay, cool. Like, it, like she's emotional and she gets emotional with films and stuff, but it was the most I've seen her be emotional with anything I've been in. And um, yeah, and my dad was like impressed and yeah, <laughs> <laughs> okay, right here. Uh, sorry, I'm Hi, Daisy. Um, my name's Jessica, nice to meet you. Um, so earlier today on Good Morning America, you were talking about how awesome it was to work with Tom Felton and you were a Harry Potter fan. Earlier today on Good Morning America, you said how great it was to work with Tom Felton. Um, Can you settle the no. rumors and tell us what your house is? <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't follow this. <laughs> so I am a big Harry Potter fan. I assumed I'd be Gryffindor. <laughs> JJ's, I'm wrong. JJ's <laughs> assistant, Ron Urara, on episode nine, we all did our houses, and I got sorted into Hufflepuff. Yeah! Oh my god, it's a good sound. <laughs> Really? And they said, oh, wait, no, maybe it was Ravenclaw. The one where it's like loyalty and, oh my God, it was a night shoot. Hufflepuff, yes. <laughs> it was like, and she goes, she goes, yeah, yeah, that makes perfect sense. I was like, oh, I guess we sort of wanted. She goes, no, it makes perfect sense. It's about loyalty and friendship. And I was like, oh my God, I'm thrilled with that. And now I feel like there should be more into Hufflepuff. Because we've seen the Gryffindor, we've seen the Slytherin. Let's make another. <laughs> with a singing female part. Um, I'm so sorry, I would love to take more questions, but this wonderful actress uh, has still another interview thing to do tonight. We are so grateful that this sneak preview had a sneak of you. We also wish this film the best. Tell your friends about Ophelia and how wonderful Daisy Ridley Thank is. Thank you so much. Thank you.